for more on this, let's cross to Martin Curring. Joining us from London, he's the head of the World Ocean Initiative. Welcome to the programme. Um, talk to us about the importance of, you know, really having a global ocean treaty and why, after two weeks of talks, couldn't uh, they agree on, on a deal to protect the oceans? Yeah, so thank you for having me. I mean, it's absolutely crucial to have a global treaty for the high seas because uh, two thirds of the ocean is actually in the high seas. Um, that's, that's half of the Earth's surface. And obviously, you know, the ocean provides lots of crucial services. I mean, climate, uh, you know, climate mitigation. There's, you know, uh, you know, as a, as a waste a management system, uh, every second breath we take is from the ocean. Um, and also the economic opportunity of the ocean. We have the World Ocean Initiative. We highlight constantly that there's lots of underutilized uh, opportunity. I mean, the ocean economy is already 2.5 trillion US dollars in terms of the, the goods and services it provides. It could, there could be much more. I mean, the uh, latest economic studies show that, you know, it could provide, uh, you, know, you, know, uh, you know, something like 40 times more in terms of the, uh, you know, the energy, it could provide six times more in terms of food, for example, seaweed and uh, sustainable seafood. This opportunity is crucial. For that, we need a global treaty um, to kind of protect the high seas and to regulate the high seas. And currently only 1.2% of the high seas are protected. Why is it so difficult to, to get an agreement? So there are four key areas that, uh, you know, that leaders are looking at. I mean, first of all, establishing marine protected areas. And that's much easier to do in, in those areas that belong to the, uh, you know, to the countries, you know, the exclusive economic zones, for example, which stretch, you know, up to 200, uh, you know, nautical miles uh, from the coast. Uh, and it's much easier to create uh, marine protected areas in the areas that countries control themselves. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's critical. The other thing is, you know, producing these kind of environmental impact assessments, actually assessing the impact of our activity in terms of shipping, fishing, energy, uh, and, and, and uh, what kind of impact it has on biodiversity. I mean, two million uh, unidentified species in the ocean, uh, uh, you know, are, are currently uh, at the peril of in terms of our activities. And, and you know, 90% of all sharks and rays, for example, are close to extinction, extinction. So we need these impact assessments. And then also we need to provide the finance and capacity building for developing countries. And there's been lots of talk around sharing of marine genetic resources. One of the sticking points here is, is how to share the benefits of, for example, finding new vaccines, finding new drugs, new chemicals, new um, genetic resources from the ocean, how to share that equally, because this is a common good. This is this is the global common. So how do we share this? Of course, developing countries want to uh, you know have a share of that, and they deserve it, to have a share of that. So there is, of course, a blame game in terms of, you know, some of the richer countries blaming, for example, Russia and China for obstructing it, whereas some of the NGOs are saying that it's actually the US and the UK and the, the EU that are not ambitious enough. There's the so-called high ambition coalition, but currently the ambition is not high enough. OK, well, let's hope they do get a, a deal agreed on next year. Martin Curring joining us from uh, the uh, World Ocean Initiative with The Economist Group. Thank you so much. Thank you.